so we're rolling. David, the first thing I want to ask you to do is just introduce yourself to the audience. My name is David Sarah Schreiber. MD and PhD. And why is this so important to you? It was several years ago. I see my mission as having to convince the legal establishment. But hopefully it's mine. Was it worth one? I might have something. But you have to be open minded. We don't even like the word cancer. We always whisper it like, cancer. <laughs> but we say we're afraid of cancer. We don't really behave like we are. We know what causes, smoking causes cancer. Yeah, I, I only smoke when I'm drinking. <laughs> Which is constant, really. This cell is cancerous. It is dividing at far too rapid a rate. We are presently in somewhat of an epidemic of cancer. Wake up, wake up, wake up! Huh? What? You have cancer! What? It's the one word you never want to hear. The number of cancer deaths across America... Got cancer. The one word that can shake you to your very core. What chance do I really have, doctor? Cancer is a death sentence. Now, the way we fight this disease is to cut it out, burn its path, and poison our bodies into oblivion. This is atomic energy as God intended it to be used. New approaches to treatment are being developed every day, and many of them are improvements. We've made real progress. This claim to cure cancer with tape-recorded music. Over time, we have built an entire industry dedicated to fighting and curing this Doctors disease. Doctors the results of a new procedure called... Billions of dollars are raised year after year to fight the war on cancer. This campaign is to place your contribution in an envelope but what if we could stop and clearly see we're making a valiant effort, but let's be honest, we're not winning this war. Maybe they'll find a cure for cancer before you or I hear the C word. Maybe they won't. But what if there's more to the story? Ready, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Before I heard the C word, my life was pretty wonderful. Not perfect, but I had what I needed. Two great kids, a big, loving family, and I just produced a film that I felt made a difference in the world. Sicko. Thank you so much. From the outside, it looked pretty great. But what no one saw was what was happening on the inside. And just three months after the best night of my life, I got the worst news possible. Now, I'm just one of the millions of people who get diagnosed with cancer every year. And like most people, I had no idea how I got there. But when it happened, my only ambition was to survive. This is the robin bird I made. Say it again. Cancer can make even the sweetest among us a little testy. That's why I ran news from my mom, because she got because she actually got out of the hospital for one. You're right. Okay. See you later. But there are also incredible gifts that come along with all that pain. I'm Dr. David Servant Schreiber. Sixteen years ago, I was diagnosed with brain cancer. With my type of cancer. I learned about another patient who was fighting back against the disease in a way that was unlike anything I'd ever heard. What if you could prevent most types of cancer by the way you live and the way you eat? 
you underwent conventional treatment, chemotherapy. Well, I realized they were doing everything they could to kill cancer cells, but they weren't doing anything to help my body resist cancer itself. The goal for all of us is to develop a science-based anti-cancer diet, is that right? Science-based anti-cancer body, I would say. Okay. It's not just about diet. When I was on my knees, David gave me hope. So I said, well, I'm gonna find him, I'm gonna meet him, I'm gonna convince him to let me make a movie on him. Joining forces with David led me to a whole team of players. And together, we would kick cancer's ass like it tried to kick mine. How often do you have a chance in life to hold in your hand something that is immensely powerful and useful that nobody else seems to know about, you know? <laughs> it's a blast. The uphill battle began in Detroit, where he's taping his lecture for a national audience on PBS. You know how cancer rates are going up and up and up and up and up. David's been given the chance to get his message out to those who need it the most. The ones who think they'll never get sick. Now, while you're there, we need you to pan the light a little bit. <laughs> Take another step that way, just a little bit. There we go. But here, in this TV studio, he couldn't be more out of his element. Together, we have this incredible opportunity to help spread a message of hope that it is in our power. An hour and a half of live television is a new and risky challenge, but it pales in comparison to how David would feel if he kept silent. What I'm about to unfold for you here today is a story. It is both a scientific story about how cancer can be weakened, but it is also, in my case, a very personal story. I was a young, very ambitious, rather arrogant, university-based physician and uh, neuroscientist with my best friend, uh, Jonathan. David and I, we actually became good friends and, and started doing this research. And it always had to be done like at nine o'clock at night when the clinical facilities were closed. And so we would go in there at night and, and you know, experiment. One evening, one of the subjects didn't show up. We didn't want to waste the precious scanner time, so we decided that I would go into the scanner. And as the images came up, I saw an anomaly, and it was pretty obvious that there was, there was something wrong. Jonathan put his hand on mine and he said, uh, David, there's something in your brain. And that's how I learned that I had brain cancer. Of course, I got conventional treatment, and that saved my life. But when the chemo stops, this is when the doctors say, go back to your life as it was. Uh, you know, let us worry about the cancer. Don't even think about it. And if this comes back, we'll catch it early next time. I wish I would have done something then. Because a few years later, as often happens with these kinds of tumors, I relapsed. And that was much harder. It was more aggressive than we had originally imagined it would be. And my own life was falling apart. My body, my life force was betraying me just when I really needed strength. And so I was slowly drifting into hopelessness. Nobody ever told me there was anything I could do to help myself. It took me a little while, you know to bounce back, but I eventually I did. So this is when I hit the books and learned as much as I could from what is in the medical literature about how I could help my body resist cancer much better than it had until now. In an effort to save his own life, David scoured medical journals and discovered results largely overlooked by a medical establishment focused on survival and a cure instead of stopping cancer before it strikes. Hidden in that massive research was critical information. We all have cancer cells inside us, right now, every one of us. These are abnormal cells, and our bodies are designed to fight and destroy them. We have the power to determine whether we feed or starve the cancer cells already inside us. 
We can help our bodies in this fight in four deceptively simple ways. Through nutrition, exercise, stress management, and avoiding toxins. Combining these four powerful tools, the anti-cancer method was born. They've uncovered the information we need to face the war on cancer in an entirely new way. Oftentimes when you ask somebody what is their risk of cancer in the general population, you may hear things like one in 100, maybe one in 10. People are shocked to learn that it's one in two. Just this decade alone, we're gonna lose 100 million lives to cancer worldwide, which exceeds the impact of heart disease, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV combined. Scientists announced today that if your hand is bigger than your face, you have cancer. Ha <laughs> ha, got you! Those are the three most life-altering words anyone can hear is you have cancer. So my life changed. But the cancer has spread to your lymph nodes. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's not good. It's tough because you feel like you've got to make sense of a situation and you don't even speak the language. So if you just step over here to the sink and drink this, well, if you say so, doctor. It was just sort of a whirlwind where you just, you kind of get put on a conveyor belt <laughs> and you're just kind of like going down the conveyor belt and people are doing things and you're just kind of like, okay, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. Mom says to stop trying to give yourself cancer. Just gonna get a little bit of cancer, Stan. I was living a very happy life and a very fulfilled life, but it was not a particularly healthy life. I was 38 and had never had a mammogram, and I felt this tumor really clear, and I just knew. The next Monday, I was in a surgeon's office who said, you have cancer, you have the, the most aggressive form of breast cancer. You're about to go on a crazy ride. stage three breast cancer. They told me it had spread. And I was in for a long, hard road of treatment. And everybody says, don't tell your kids that you're gonna be okay, because then if you're not, you lied to them and blah, blah, blah. But I was like, no, I'm gonna be fine. You know, I didn't want them to take on that too in their little brains. But there are no guarantees. And there are so many things I still wanted to do. We all have cancer cells. I had never learned that in medical school. And this is the worst news of the evening. It gets better after this. <laughs> Look at the data if you can. But raw data is challenging. It's hard, right? Who can read cancer journals? And you need somebody to filter through the signs, understand what is important, what can give hope, and then spread that message. But a new take on an old problem isn't always what people want to hear. Dr. David Servan Schreiber says, we are in the midst of a self-inflicted cancer epidemic. As a oncologist reading this book, what were your thoughts? Complete and utter tosh. Well-meaning tosh, but tosh. How yes. do people know what to believe when every five minutes there's a doctor with a good story and he cites a bunch of studies, then I talk to you and he says, you say it's garbage. How do we know what this to believe? To the Canadian That's the big criticism of a lot of the things that you're saying, what David's saying is, sounds good, but th there's no science behind oh, it. Oh, Jesus. And a lot of people have big mouth there, and they're talking about things that they don't know. My lab is focused on cancer treatment.
Cancer is not something that strikes you suddenly when you're 60, 65, 70. The first cell that are mutated that gives rise to a cancer appears when you are 15, 16, 17, and it takes decades for this single mutated cell to give a clinically expressed cancer. It's estimated today that about 70% of all cancer death could be prevented by simple change in lifestyle. 70%. The first evidence that cancer was lifestyle-related originates when we start comparing the rates of cancer worldwide. In the 80s, the Japanese population start westernizing its lifestyle and diet. In 2005, the rate of colorectal cancer in Japan is the highest in the world, from one of the lowest in the world, within 25 years. So it is this change in the incidence of cancer within the same population that we, in cancer, discover that the way we live influences the way we die. Just to show you how big a 52-inch casket is, it's the size of a double bed. The overall need for oversized caskets goes up every year. You're talking about something that's going to have to be moved with some kind of machinery. Obesity has been shown to be a key factor in the development of cancer because the most inflammatory cells in a human body are the fat cells. When you are overweight, that creates a chronic inflammatory condition that favors physiologically the development of tumor. This is the map of obesity in America in 1985. Slightly darker blue, less than 10%. Light blue is between 10 and 15%. Now I want to show you what an epidemic looks like. 1985, 86, 90, 91. The first states with more than 15%, 95, 2000, 2001, 2005. The first states with more than a third of the people obese, 2006, 2007. 2008. So this may be the map of cancer in our country in 10 years. Which is a pretty scary perspective. We've entered the age of convenience. We're sleeping less, consuming more, and physical activity is a choice, not a necessity. When we live in a sedentary state, all of our body systems are weakened, which creates an environment that feeds the growth of cancer cells inside us. So what happens if you introduce even a moderate amount of exercise into your life? With this anti-cancer pillow, your body will start to repair itself from within, cleaning out contaminants so when you exercise, you are decreasing your cancer risk. At the same time, you'll also reduce excess hormones that stimulate cancer growth, all of which boosts your immune system and makes you more resistant to disease. With all that going on, odds are you'll feel better too. And you can do it by taking just one small step, and then another, and another, and another. I actually thought that I was going to get breast cancer at some point. It was one of the first things Meg told me when <laughs> I met her, actually. Really romantic. When I was diagnosed with a recurrence, a, a recurrence will wake you up in a way that even the original diagnosis did not. And I realized, holy cow, I've, I've got this thing. Like, I really have to figure out what to do now. I can't just rely on the conventional treatments. I have to really figure out how I can help myself. And so I said to my oncologist, okay, if I were your wife, what would you tell me to do? And he said, uh, well, I'd tell you to exercise. Can you tell me why, as a cancer patient, I need to exercise? And he said, Meg, just exercise. When you're Asking people or suggesting that they make a lifestyle change, but not giving them the reason, what are the odds that they're gonna actually, you know, 
haul their sorry self out of bed on a Sunday morning and go exercise. Practically nil. Here's a study of women who had breast cancer and we're looking at their sense of survival. The best they can do is moderate physical activity, which means 30 minutes of walking six times a week. Reduction in mortality of 50%. Now this is an enormous number. Now had my oncologist told me that, I mean, I would have made that change immediately. Olympic athlete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We know so much about what patients can do to delay or forestall disease that the fact that they are not given this information by their doctors borders on malpractice. Mm. There's a massive ignorance. And I think this is pretty much true for most physicians. You know, we are trained to do surgery and medications. Then once we start practicing, we're reimbursed to do surgery and medication. And because you can't make money with it, whatever else is not surgery and medication, uh, we think of it as not medicine. Dave is on a mission to change the way we think about actual health care to empower patients and their doctors. You know, it's not just about adding pomegranate juice or drinking green tea. These are great things to do, but just one thing isn't gonna make a difference, right? You're gonna have to combine them, change your lifestyle. It's as if all the varied experiences in his life have led him to this moment. He's the scientist, the patient, and the doctor all rolled into one. So tell us about your methods. Well, not, none of them are my methods, which is the other thing I found interesting. They were all there in the scientific literature. Critics would say, you know something, nutrition, exercise, it's just not evidence-based medicine. Well, by the time we have enough evidence, I'm gonna be dead. So I'd better start acting on the basis of what I can find now in the scientific literature and what makes the most sense. And if I can do something that is very likely to help me and has very few chances of hurting me, uh, then I'm going to do it, whatever the critics say. Il a demandé à sa secrétaire qui s'appelait Delphine euh, après euh, la fin de cette euh, session de formation euh, mes coordonnées. Donc on, on s'est eu au téléphone euh, après et, euh, et à peine on s'était parlé cinq minutes qu'il me disait j'ai pas envie de m'engager, j'ai peur, enfin, je veux pas faire d'enfant. C'est une danse. Oh, putain, quelle horreur. Et je lui disais mais David, si on doit se voir, ce sera pour prendre un verre d'abord. Moi, le premier truc qui m'a complètement troublé, c'est-à-dire que je l'ai vu sur scène quand je l'ai rencontré pour la première fois, il me dit « bof, c'est pas mon genre d'homme, quoi, du tout. » Et c'est son regard. Il y a un truc, c'est son, j'ai toujours dit, son regard de petit garçon. Il a besoin d'intensité, David. Il a besoin d'intensité pour se sentir vivant. I actually feel a lot healthier today than I ever was before I had cancer. It's every time I think about it, it blows my mind. Uh, it's too bad I had to go through cancer to get there, you know, and so what I wish for most people is, you know, why don't you do this now so that you won't even get cancer? I came to Memphis because I literally read somewhere that Memphis was the poorest major city in America. So I came here with about $12 in my pocket, literally not knowing a soul. What people know us for and at the uh, core of what we do is provide health care for people who work in low-wage jobs who don't have health insurance. Okay, all right, I'll see you in two weeks. All right. They shine your shoes, cook your food, they'll one day dig your grave. They don't complain. Yet when they get sick, their options are very few. If we were to develop a process whereby when you come to the doctor, it's all focused on the future. You know, what do you need to do to stay healthy? That makes a lot of sense. I wanted to talk to you about the connection between obesity and diabetes and obesity and cancer. I don't know how many people you have with cancer who come through here. Yeah, a lot. I mean, we see a lot of them. 
Almost every person in our clinic is a cancer patient ready to happen. My father died of cancer, lung cancer. My sister-in-law died of cancer. My grandmother died of cancer. My, and, and my daddy was a diabetic. My grandmother was a diabetic. But they were, I was not. When I came down with diabetes, I didn't want to go on the needle. This is Erica, my fitness coach, um, young lady that is helping me. She makes sure my blood pressure is good. Still high. Still high. Yeah. Never this high. Never. <laughs> okay. Changing the way we eat, you can't do that overnight. We didn't do it overnight. It's not easy. You're gonna be watching TV and a commercial will come on. And there's a beverages and cold ice water running down beside it. And you gotta struggle. Cheeseburger? Yes. I love Paris in the summer when it's sizzling. You, you got what I eat. And then finally reality hits you that a change has got to be made. Either you're going to uh, go on the court play ball or stay on the bench. And I want to play ball. The doing of this is not rocket science. Well, why haven't we figured it out yet? We have not put enough of our resources into developing what real prevention looks like. When you look at the cost that America puts into healthcare, and then you look at the outcomes, in any other business, you would say, this model's broken. Somebody got to change that. We spend most of our healthcare dollars treating preventable diseases. We are getting sicker while a few companies get richer. We figured <coughs> you'd <coughs> be here. <coughs> Cigarettes, they're killers. I met up with a small town lawyer who took on the tobacco giants and won. That's my daughter, and that's my grandchild, Kate. We all do what we can do to help people. And I think that's pretty much the American spirit. I don't see anything special about me at all. I'm a redneck from Mississippi. My fight started in 1986 out on the street corner out there. A friend of mine named Nathan Horton came by, and he told me that he had lung cancer and that his doctor had told him that cigarettes caused his lung cancer. And he said, that doesn't seem right. I ought to be able to sue him. These people who are causing the deaths of millions of people worldwide, uh, and, and they knew what they were doing. So it became personal for me. Do you think the Surgeon General of the United States is more qualified than you are to determine if cigarette smoking is hazardous to your health? Frankly, no. The tobacco companies got together and set up a scientific advisory board. The scientists quickly understood if you want to get money from them, you do things that are not going to find cigarettes cause cancer. And the theme was create doubt. How can cigarette smoking be the cause of lung cancer if the cause of lung cancer is, as yet, unknown? There was an, an active, concerted effort to lie to the American people. This is the open-minded approach the tobacco industry follows, and which it commends to others. When we tried Nathan Horton's case, the defense was that nobody made him smoke. He assumed the risk. Cancer is a great mystery. Americans have the right to choose. They wrap themselves in the American flag. I mean, it's perverse now to think about it, but that's what they did. State attorneys general and a group of private lawyers got the tobacco industry to admit in bold new warnings on cigarettes that their product is addictive, causes cancer, and kills smokers. It was a 14-year fight until we finally brought it home. But they could see the future better than we could. And so they diversified. Big tobacco 
took the billions of profits they made from generations of addicted smokers and invested in something more family friendly. Something that could have a big effect on our future. Something that we consume every day. The food we eat. In 1985, tobacco giant R.J. Reynolds bought Nabisco Foods. Tobacco pioneer Philip Morris bought General Foods and three years later, Kraft Foods, making them the largest food producer in North America. And leaving the business of food in the capable hands of the same corporations who helped addict us to tobacco. Using the same tactics they used to promote tobacco, food companies set about peddling the entire planet a diet of processed goods loaded with chemicals and additives masquerading as food. This new machine operates with specific targets in mind, like addicting consumers without them knowing it. Nowadays, practically everything's in a package. You don't know what's in that package except what the label is. You have to be able to trust the label. The food companies have taken advantage of that. And the fact is, is that the food is loaded with chemicals and artificial ingredients and things like sugar. And I looked at your Chobani yogurt, and there's no sugar there listed. But there is evaporated cane juice. I don't know what that is, but juice, that's natural. I don't know. And all it is is sugar. They make up names, and it's illegal to do that. Welcome back, my guest tonight. Pulitzer winning uh, a reporter. He writes for the New York Times. His new book is called Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. Please welcome to the program, Michael Moss. Sir! If, if a banana and an apple were cheaper, maybe I wouldn't eat a yodel, but holy <laughs> are yodels tasty. I don't like... know if you notice, but it melts in your mouth. Oh, when I've it, noticed. When it... <laughs> Too much of these foods, which I like to call the foods we hate to love, um, can make you overweight or otherwise ill. But now we know that they've known this for years and years, even as they continued adding in heaps of salt, sugar, and fat to their product. You can see through the records that I was able to obtain, the meeting minutes and the memos, the tobacco executives met with their food division people. They would nudge and cajole them and push them to sell more product and make more money. These are probably the height <laughs> of food engineering. Put a cheat on your mouth, what happens? Dissolves. That sends a signal to your brain that keep going, right? I think we finally found their weakness, Mr. Lee. The whole point is that we're not just trying to get people to like our products. We want them to want more and more of them. But there's no word they hate more than the A word, addiction. Even according to these scientists who work with the food industry, in their words, the industry has been exploiting the biology of the child by orienting so many of its products toward sweetness. So when you go back to the perimeter of the store for those vegetables, especially that sort of high-powered nutrition blockbuster broccoli, the kid is going, this is what I want, tang, you know, I don't want the broccoli. I do not like broccoli. <laughs> and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid. And my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States. And I'm not going to eat any more broccoli. Now there's another vegetable in trouble. Asked about Brussels sprouts, the president gave a decisive thumbs down. It's pretty easy to knock what's good for you and much harder to sell it. I just don't know how to get the word out about Florida blueberries. March, April, May, With all this stellar PR, it's no wonder we eat more processed food than anywhere else on the planet. Thanks, guys. This is the modern farm in America. It's called the industrial feedlot. Where do you see the green here? Uh, there is no green in the modern feedlot. Why is that? Because instead of eating grass, 
These animals are eating only corn and soy. Why should we uh, worry about that? Well, because it turns out that grass is filled with omega-3 fatty acids, which actually reduce cell growth and reduce inflammation. And corn and soy are filled with omega-6 fatty acids. The omega-6 fatty acid, it turns out, raise inflammation in the body, they stimulate cell growth. So what happens? When these animals no longer eat grass and eat corn and soy, the meat that comes from cows is filled with what? With omega-6 fatty acid. What's the American national dish? Hamburger and french fries, right? Uh, you know that industrial red meat has been identified as being one of the worst promoters of colon cancer. The vegetable we put with it, french fries, and it turns out that potatoes actually bring up blood sugar. Then we fry the oil so that it sucks up all our antioxidant defenses in our body. And then we make that our national dish. Now you'd think that it was the defense department that made this like the national dish for another country that they want to get rid of. You know? I reference McDonald's a lot because I go to McDonald's. <laughs> I love the silence that follows that statement. <laughs> Because we all know better, right? We've all read the articles, seen those documentaries. It's the same message. Look, McDonald's is really bad for you. It's very high in fat and calories, and we don't even know where the meat comes from. And we're all like, that's disgusting. I'll have a Big Mac, a large fry, and a two-gallon drum of Diet Coke. i just like to see one commercial that showed people five minutes after they ate McDonald's. Oh. <laughs> Momentary pleasure followed by incredible guilt, eventually leading to cancer. <laughs> I'm loving it. <laughs> Brad, uh, give me a little more juice. Check, 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 check. You know, it's interesting, when I was in the hospital, the first meal that they served me after surgery, I couldn't believe it. They served me a sloppy joe. You know, I wasn't a super healthy guy at all, but they brought this sloppy joe out. And I'm like, surely this is not what I should be eating just after you took it out a third of my large intestine. There's sort of a small movement that says, don't blame the victim. But if you accept the fact that maybe you contributed to your problem, then the natural logic says, well, maybe I can contribute to solving the problem. If I cause this, maybe I can fix it. You got to care about your life if you want me to help you figure out a way to live your life better. If I weigh 300 pounds and I'm fighting cancer, and you pointing your finger at me, thinking that that's going to make me healthier, I don't think so. That wouldn't make me change. That's why in our wellness center, you'll notice everything is about community. And it's about doing this together. Because that's where the magic happens. You have to realize that you as an individual need help. It, it never even dawned on me what I was doing to this body. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Miss Brenda. How you doing? Good, how are you? Great. She was having multiple sweet drinks every day and then... Two um, liters. Two liters. I wasn't going to say it, she said it, yeah. Plenty of Pepsi. Yeah, and so just seeing that those little changes, you know, it's small steps. Maybe it didn't all go at once. It no, just, it didn't. I have not had a Coke, a Sprite, a Kool-Aid drink since February. Nothing but water. For a better start in life, start cola earlier. Of course, sugar contributes to the diabetes epidemic and the obesity epidemic, but unfortunately, we now know, and it's a recent discovery, that sugar contributes to cancer as well. 
Nearly a third of some common cancers, including breast and colon cancers, have something called insulin receptors on their surface. Insulin binds to these receptors and signals the tumor to start consuming glucose. When we eat or drink sugar, it can serve as a catalyst to fuel certain types of cancers. The whole idea that cancer actually feeds off of sugar, particularly a cancer like mine, I was literally like feeding it as I was trying to fight it in the same moment, like in the chemo suite, sucking on a tangy taffy, which is so absurd, but I didn't know. I mean, I just had no, I had no idea. And nobody told me. <laughs> yeah. We've invented phenomenal vehicles for pouring sugar into people without them noticing. We live in a fast-paced world, and our food has adapted at warp speed. But our bodies were built to thrive on healthy fuel, unprocessed nutrients like fruits, vegetables, protein, and water. It's a pretty simple concept but the results are much more extraordinary than you might think. It's the reaction inside our bodies on a cellular level that makes the nutrition pillar a powerful tool of the anti-cancer method. We know that this lifestyle change that I made, and not only for myself, but I made it uh, for my family. This is my daughter, Trivia. She has uh, lost 68 pounds, and we are so proud of her, and she said her goal is to lose 80 more pounds. I work 11 to 7, and I work at a hospital, so y'all know it's very stressful. So when I get off, when I used to get off work in the morning at 7.30, I knew all the restaurants I was gonna hit. You know, I was gonna do McDonald's one day, Chick-fil-A the next day, Burger King the next day. I had them all mapped out. And I would do that and it would be a comfort to me after a hard night's work. But I didn't realize that it was making me gain the weight. You know, it makes no sense that you can't do anything to help your body be more protected against cancer. Obviously, the food you eat every day, three times a day, has to have an impact. So tell me, what should I eat? What's the typical anti-cancer plate? Mostly vegetables, mostly plant-based. Obviously, foods contain molecules, and some of these molecules happen to have very specific and potent anti-cancer activity. And a researcher at uh, the University of Montreal, he had the idea of buying a new piece of equipment for his $40 million lab. Uh, he bought a juicer. We've been looking at the anti-cancer properties of uh, molecules in food for, uh, for about 15 years. Okay. So why, when we talk about prevention, are plants so important? Oh, that's, uh, I haven't seen this result. That's very good. How do plants that have no arms to fight and no legs to run, protects themselves against plant-eating animals, bacteria, virus, insect. Plants defend themselves by producing thousands and thousands of substances that are either toxic or killing the bacteria that try to eat them. These molecules, we call them phytochemicals. Phyto means plant, chemicals from plant. And by pure serendipity of evolution, out of these thousands of phytochemicals, a couple of thousand also have anti-cancer properties. This should not be a big surprise because about 50% of the drugs we use in the clinic to treat cancer today, Taxol, Vincristine, Vinblastine, and so on, are isolated originally from plants. This part here is a human tumor so these mice are being treated with various uh, food extract, broccoli and garlic and blueberry. And it shrunk the tumor by yeah. how much? 90%. Nine zero. Nine, Nine zero. Nine. Wow, that's crazy. 
Yeah, if you would have these types of results with drugs that would be tested from the pharmaceutical industry, I would call the head of research anywhere he would be on the planet at any time of the day and tell him, Bob, we've got an incredible results with compound W6NN9W9. And he would say, what is it? And it's a 90% reduction. He would be excited like crazy. And if you eat plants, you put in your bloodstream these compounds that have shown to have anti-cancer properties. It's the family of cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprout, broccoli, garlic, and onion, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, some spices such as ginger and turmeric have the most potent plant-based anti-inflammatory molecules that have been found in nature. So when people say that there's no evidence, these people don't know what they're talking about. Alors ça, est-ce que c'est pas des banalités C'est évidemment la question qu'on a envie de vous poser. Euh, il y a trois ans, quand, quand j'ai publié ce livre pour la première fois, euh, je me suis fait insulter en disant qu'est-ce que c'est que ce mec qui dit qu'on peut aider à guérir le cancer avec des framboises. C'était considéré comme de l'imposture d'oser suggérer qu'il y avait un impact de l'alimentation sur le devenir de la maladie cancer. De mon point de vue, ce qui est révolutionnaire, c'est que des banalités ont un impact aussi important sur des maladies aussi graves et qu'on ne le dit pas et qu'on ne s'en sert pas. Donc, est-ce que c'est des banalités ou est-ce que c'est révolutionnaire C'est à vous de me le dire. You know, I think this is actually something that happens to most people who go through a life-threatening experience. There, there's, a, there's a moment where a period of time after you uh, looked at death in the eye and thought this was the end, you, you become very humble. You know, it's an incredibly humbling experience. And arrogance, if it's part of your makeup, which it was for me, it's also what makes you say that your little life may have something to contribute to other people. Uh, in my case, it's, it's a family trait, so, you know. <laughs> My father, he, um, he escaped from France to become a, a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot during World War II. And then he started his own newspaper when he was 28. Which became the most successful uh, news magazine. And he sort of passed on the message to his children that, you know, if you want to do something, do it. And so, you know, there was never any sense that uh, if, if you wanted to do something, it, it wouldn't work. And so he pushed us. Quand tu seras euh, plus grand, enfin, tu seras comme ton père, tu feras de la politique, si tu as envie Non. Non Pourquoi Je préfère être docteur, des choses comme ça. David se devait d'être prophète, qui se devait de laisser une trace, qui se devait de reprendre le flambeau. Il m'a toujours dit, euh, combien de fois il m'a dit, mon cancer m'a sauvé la vie. Parce que sinon, je serais resté ce petit con que j'étais. Non, je ne pense pas que je suis. Je vais recevoir un scan Friday. And I get one every six months. I never know. This is not a cancer that goes away. You know? What kind is it? It's, it's a brain tumor, so it's something that you have to, uh, you can contain it, maybe, hopefully, but you can't get rid of it. I think there's some research which shows that you can reduce tumors in the brain mm -hmm. with a dietary approach. Yes, absolutely. So but, you eat something or other to stop the brain. Well, that's what I do. Yeah. I follow every single principle that's in here. Isn't it shrinking? It's, shri it's shrunk enough that I'm okay, but uh, you know, it's, it doesn't, it never you goes completely you away. 17 years. Then you yeah. did. On the yeah, picture? You look a lot younger, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. We're all vulnerable to cancer. But once you have it, it never really leaves you. And midway through filming, there were signs that my cancer might have come back. 
you know, cancer was kind of in the rear view mirror. And when I found out that actually it was fine and there, there was no recurrence, I think everybody felt happy, you know, relieved. But all of my sisters, within a couple of weeks, went to go get their checkup and their, you know, their mammograms. And uh, my younger sister, Liz, got diagnosed with, with breast cancer. You know, there was some solace in being able to kind of really, really, really be there, like be both like sister, nurse, listener. But I had this other layer in my mind, which is knowing even more than she knew what she was gonna go through, because you don't wanna freak anybody out. It's really, really, it was, it was sad, it was hard. So Thanksgiving is tomorrow, and we are heading home to eat yummy food and see family and everything else, but um, also going there to help Liz with her surgery. What kind of surgery is she having? She is gonna have uh, what I had right. three years ago, um, and it's called a double mastectomy. Wow, I thought it was just called cancer. Yeah, it's a big, big word. We didn't, we weren't really using those kind of words when, when I had it, right? No. It's a deeply internally painful, physically painful fight, and then you're fighting for your life. You know, patients are stressed out by the fact that they're having cancer, and it's going to be a tough battle. And the treatments are even worse than the disease, but. You cannot patent broccoli, fish, jogging, uh, reaching out to friends to reduce stress. You can't patent any of that. Even though there's good science showing that it's extremely important to reduce your chances of ever dying from your cancer. Reducing mortality, you know, it's not just improving quality of life. It's about reducing mortality. Sometimes I factor four. I might get my cancer, my tumor back in next week. You know. Hope not, but who knows? you can have a profound impact on what the outcome is gonna be. Nobody's preventing that information from getting to people who may need it, but because you can't make money with it, nobody's pushing for that information to be more widely available or used by patients. You. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Prevention is difficult to implement in a population because we live in a consumer society where we want the candy now. With the strength of Zantac handling your heartburn, you can keep on enjoying all the foods you love. We like pills in the Western world. We want to smoke, we want to be overweight, we don't want to eat vegetables, we don't want to exercise. And at 50, at 60, we develop type 2 diabetes, cancer, heart disease. And you ask people to do something today for benefits in 30 years. Who wants to do that? And when anyone tries to tell us we should stop eating and drinking ourselves to death, well, this happens. Yo, Bloomberg, you think drinking 16 ounces of Coke is bad for you? I mean, I think Bloomberg's a douche. Obesity is getting worse, and everybody's wringing their hands. I got to do something about it. Nobody's doing anything about it. Some people say it's about personal freedom. It's about not wanting government to tell them what to do. Where did I hear this before? Wasn't it smoking? But today, obesity is one of the biggest problems this country has. Do you has. have to explain that by banning a certain size soft drink or sugary drink? This is the most ridiculous sort of nanny statism. It's none of the mayor's business how much soda people are drinking. The double gulp. The provided container holds almost five cans of soda, which is the equivalent of eating over 40 Oreos. Obesity is not a public health problem. Obesity is a private health problem. According to Open Secrets, Big Food spent $27 million lobbying politicians last year. Coca-Cola and Pepsi led the charge. Just as Detroit hated it when laws mandated seatbelts and the tobacco industry hated it when smokers were forced outside of restaurants. Today it's cigarettes, tomorrow it's candy. The restaurant industry hates this new regulation designed to promote health and like the others, is making the freedom argument. Mississippi lawmakers have approved what they're calling the anti-Bloomberg bill. Tony Smith is the state senator who's putting limits on policymakers to keep soda bans out of Mississippi. 
Yeah. You know, we, we want you to be able to come to Mississippi and operate your business with the least amount of intrusive government as possible. One of Smith's top campaign contributors is the Mississippi branch of the National Restaurant Association. The NRA advocates for food companies, including the ones that make their money off of giant beverages, like Dunkin' Donuts, KFC, and home of the Big Gulp, 7-Eleven. I was approached by the Restaurant Association, and they said, look, we see this sort of coming across the nation. We'd like to do a preemptive bill that would prevent uh, a municipality of mandating what a restaurant could or could not serve. And these sodas are mammoth. I mean, they're huge. Like, it's really kind of, there's no point to it when you think right. about it. It was sort of like people were standing up for the right to really hurt themselves. No, they're standing up for freedom of choice. We're not against trying to be a healthier Mississippi. We're not against that. But it's, it's there again, we're, we're talking about regulation. That's what the bill addresses, regulations. You're not for regulation, really, mm -mm. at all. You're on the health committee as I well. am public health public and health. welfare. Okay, uh -huh. so public health, we're in Mississippi, right? Highest obesity rates in the country. I think Americans have enough common sense. Some make real healthy choices. Some still like to buy the pizza and the french fries. Okay, let the market. Just let the market decide what you gotta do. Now, I'm no politician, but letting the market decide doesn't seem to be helping people living in the state of Mississippi. Worst results in nearly every category. Holmes County, Mississippi, where I live, has the highest rate of amputation from diabetes of any place in the United States, right here in this little, this, this pretty little town that you're in. These are my neighbors, these are my friends, these are people that I've lived with all of my 68 years. When I realized that this is not some accident, it's the food that they think is the same is not the same anymore. So you are up for another fight, a big fight. This, for this, this is it. This, I mean, this, I'm, up, I'm up for this fight. Mm -hmm. This will be, this will be enough mm -hmm. for me. Whether we're liberal or whether we're conservative, we've all got that streak in us. But the fact is, you cannot have free choice unless you have an informed choice. And you can't have an informed choice if they're lying about what's on the label. What about Pam cooking spray? Everybody knows what PAM is. It's some kind of little healthy oil with compressed air that you spray it and it gets on your pan. It's not compressed air that, you know, and they don't tell you, but it's butane and propane. People don't understand that they are spraying lighter fluid on their children's hot cakes. And it's, and it's fabulously successful. But we're gonna sue their pants off. They may have a lot more lawyers sitting around their table. But you know what? They can't talk but one at a time. And then our work is done. I can go fishing with my grandson. Now, do you have kind of a structure that you're sequenced? I, I do. Let's address some of the myths and the fears. You want to get into that? Yes. One thing people don't realize is how exceptional the U.S. approach is to the whole area. Exceptional in a good way? No, uh, exceptional in allowing every part of health and illness to be commercialized. When we go to most doctors with any problem, from an acid reflux to high blood pressure to high cholesterol, or even an inability to sleep, what do we get? A pill. Not to cure us, but to make the symptoms go away. So we pop the pill, feel a little better, and then we carry on with the behavior that got us sick in the first place. But inside of us, our immune cells are just getting weaker, and our bodies become ideal breeding grounds for cancer. This business of masking symptoms instead of discovering and preventing their causes, is booming. And after a lifetime of this, we eventually end up at the door of another doctor 
asking for a different, more powerful, and much more expensive drug. Only one of the 12 new cancer drugs approved last year extend life more than two months, and the other 11 don't. But they're all being priced at $100,000 or, or more. Drug companies keep raising prices on last year's drugs. So it's as if Toyota raised the prices on last year's Camry. <laughs> it's sort of unthinkable. But it's done routinely, in the, only in the United States. No one's going to stop them. Exactly. But that's because they and their lobbyists have set up rules to protect them from competition. You might not buy a new TV set because the economy's lousy or a new car, but medicine? Cancer killing the, uh, something that can combat cancer? Hey, that's the kind of purchase you don't defer. Throw the switch in the right direction for a future of health and happiness. There's such a cancer train, and I've been on it. Caring about somebody else who had cancer and going for walks and raising money, being in treatment, I've certainly benefited from drugs that a lot of that research goes into, but we've been looking at this disease the wrong way. We don't even think about cancer until it happens and we're losing sight of what is actually a really simple message that could save people from ever having to, to enter into that world in the first place. But we're not there yet. For Carol. For my wife. For my mom. For every pink bucket of grilled or original recipe, KFC makes a 50 cent contribution to Susan G. Komen for the cure. Together, we could make the largest... There will never be a single cure for all cancer. It's not one single mutation. It's a complete chromosomal disarray inside the cell. So to think that one single drug will treat all cancer without side effect is a myth. But when you turn on the news, you'd think we're curing cancer every day. Well, tonight, you're about to see a discovery. Researchers may have discovered a miracle drug. We're actually talking about a cure. It makes for exciting TV that completely misses the big story. The studies that informed anti-cancer have been published for decades, but no one is talking about them, and no one has to incorporate them because there aren't clinical results like the ones we get with drug trials. All the tests about cancer are tests of cancer. How strong is your tumor? We're not looking at anything that measures your body's resistance to cancer. There isn't a big industry out there to fund lifestyle change research. Conducting randomized clinical trials in this nation is primarily funded by the pharmaceutical industry because they have a drug that they're going to sell, and it's a business. So to talk about something like physical activity and modifying somebody's diet, who's incentivized to find the positive study? The pieces of the puzzle are on different tables. So we need to put them on the same table to create this comprehensive care plan but we need to do the clinical trial to really show that that's the case. I think what's exciting is to make the demonstration that we can act on the tumor microenvironment. David knows this is his opportunity to change the way the medical community approaches the disease. And really put on the map the importance of uh, lifestyle interventions. As, and uh, he's spending the... every waking moment making sure the study launches. But they don't really do that, though. <laughs> we believe, let's look at it and see if it's what we were planning on doing anyway. Allô? Bébé, c'est moi. Ça va? Salut, chérie. C'est quoi la bonne nouvelle? <laughs> J'étais sûre que tu n'avais pas lu ton message correctement. Tu relis ton message SMS. Ah bon? Vraiment nous, oui, hein. Hola, mi amor, si tout va bien, nous fêterons la nouvelle année 2011 avec Bébita. Ah Hola <rire> Ouh <rire> On est des warriors. Ah, grave, ouais. 
<rire> Moi qui pensais que j'avais animé mon sperme avec mon téléphone portable. <rire> Ça va Tu respires Ouais. ouais, ouais. <rire> tu vas me faire pleurer et c'est pas le maman. Non, mais pleure pas, chérie. On s'aime, c'est tout. <rire> After World War II, the chemicals that were created for the war machine entered the manufacturing and agricultural industries here at home. Synthetic chemicals, which made for cheap, new, and longer-lasting products, flooded the market, but remained untested for safety to humans. And those toxins still remain in many of our products today. So unlike the exercise and nutrition pillars, where we're often fighting against our own bad habits and ignorance, the struggle with the toxin anti-cancer pillar begins with trying to find out what dangers are hiding in plain sight. Shiny suns, we shiny suns, we shine like only shiny suns. Morning! You've forgotten us already? Oh. <laughs> Chemical residue left over from your cleaner. Made from toxic ingredients. We give you the impression of clean. And then we get to watch you clean. <laughs> yeah. I think there is a fundamental assumption by consumers that when they go into a store, no matter what the product, that somebody somewhere has tested it and has is protecting them. That it is safe to buy if it's out there. Um, and that is just a false assumption. There is no pretesting. You are the guinea pig. What kind of pre-market testing is required by the FDA of ingredients before they're allowed to go into products? There is no pre-market approval requirement. Companies are responsible for ensuring that um, the products they market are safe, but they are not required to submit the results of testing to us. So, <laughs> you know, the fox reports whether chickens are dying in the chicken coop. <laughs> I think that's pretty hilarious, uh, pretty uh, riddled with conflict of interest. And the FDA has never been very willing to protect the public from unsafe products. In Europe, 1,100 different ingredients have either been banned or regulated because they've been found to be harmful or toxic. But in the U.S., it's only 11. So Just like big tobacco, the cosmetics industry set up a scientific review board. And you'll never guess who's on it. The Cosmetic Ingredient Review evaluates the safety of ingredients in cosmetics. And they were established by the cosmetics industry, and it's currently funded by the cosmetics industry itself. And yet this is the organization that the FDA goes to when there's, there's a new issue of concern. Um, the, the recent example being the use of formaldehyde in high concentrations in, in, in products like Brazilian Blowout. The hair care option contains a possible carcinogen. And come clean at the very beginning this here. This is very worrisome given that I have tried it myself. Mm -hmm. But you know what, it's amazing. It, it really does work, I have to say. Even though it was pulled from the market in most places in the world because of regulatory restrictions, the FDA still did nothing. And the product is still available on the market. This is a sunscreen product. Two ingredients in the product were flagged for higher hazard concerns, and that was fragrance and vitamin A. The two ingredients that you flagged sound like two of the most harmless ones. Fragrance and a vitamin, exactly. If you look at your labels, often it just says fragrance, and there's a lot of chemicals that could be hidden in there. You may have used something that caused a little rash or, or itching, um, but you probably didn't think that there could be carcinogens, cancer-causing chemicals. I mean, feel my hair, Ron. It feels, doesn't I'm it feel nice? Like that's really nice. <laughs> and I mean, you know. We've been on a test diet with our planet and our bodies for 60 years with dumping all manner of toxins out there, and, and the results are coming in, and we see this in, in, in rates of disease and environmental contamination. I'm taking a video. Uh, we're gonna test. What? Yeah. Back at home, my sister had just begun chemotherapy. 
and I was there for a moment that I knew very well. It's not genetics. We've all been tested. We don't have the breast cancer gene. I have a big family, and that increases the odds. But if the odds are one in two men and one in three women, we're kind of right on target. It just happened younger. done with my intensive chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, I ended up in the hospital for a week. My body was completely shot, and Lizzie was the opposite. She was participating in getting herself healthy from the get-go. She wasn't waiting until after treatment. Looks like your sister. I, I do. <laughs> you, guys look, you guys look the same. We've heard that a lot. The nature of cancer treatment, it, it's a lot of things happening to you. You yeah. look well. Thank, Thank you. you. I mean, I really, honestly, I don't feel sick. The power of this for people who have a diagnosis already is that there are things that you can do to fuel yourself, to make your body better able to withstand all of the things that you're going to have to go through to get cancer out of your system. You can actually be a partner in that process. You don't just, you know, have to endure it. And you can have hope. After this last baby, um, prior to being diagnosed, I was boxing twice a week wow. um, for like a half hour. And I mean, I loved it. It was like a workout and therapy all at once. <laughs> the benefit of reducing side effects an improving outcome with chemo is somewhere close to 40%. Oh, wow. Basically, Trying to seek out an acupuncturist or nutritionist or an exercise therapist, it all costs money, and, and you have to know to look for it. So if it isn't just a part of what you're dealing with when you go to a doctor, many people either can't afford it or don't even know it exists. But when you find it and embrace it, the changes that follow are profound. Hi, welcome. How are you? I'm great. I'm oh, great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm Two good. weeks ago, I went to the doctor. Didn't expect this good news. I no longer take the high blood pressure medicine, no man. Nice. That is an awesome, awesome blessing. I never thought I'd get off high blood pressure. How long were you on it? Over three years. Wow. Over that three years. Is... Took it religiously every day. I test sometime to get upset quickly, you know, and it was one of the things my coach told me to rest, mm -hmm. stop stressing, because all of these things feeds into the disease. Yeah. So I stopped all that. It is that, what it is. That is fantastic. And my husband, Elbert, lost 62 pounds. Oh my gosh. He was almost, he was almost 300. I don't know, I, I love being like my mama, so I started getting on the weight loss journey with her. I come from 250 to 194, so I'm I'm doing good. Uh, you're doing real good. Yeah, hard. I'm doing good. <laughs> water, it was a no-no in my house. We didn't, we didn't drink water. We bathed. We washed our face, <laughs> our clothes, the dishes. You know, boil something. Water. Now all of my children drink water. You do know, in order to eat healthy, it costs more. Uh huh. Yeah. But guess what? You save on doctor bills and clothes. All right. <laughs> and so, Somebody's ready. All right. I want you to sit right here. Let's entertain our guests. Do you want one or two? Um, just some of the family veggies. Ah, bah, la naissance de Charlie, c'était, uh, c'était un moment de, de grande, grande émotion. Donc ça, c'était euh, un grand, grand, grand moment dans, dans ma vie, dans la sienne, je crois aussi. Puis après, on... puis en août, on est parti à l'île de Ré. Je me souviens très bien de dire tous les jours, d'avoir dit quasiment tous les jours, 
J'ai l'impression que c'est les meilleurs moments de, de notre vie qu'on vit. Enfin, c'est des instants. J'avais honte de regarder les gens dans les yeux, tellement je me sentais heureuse. Dans cet endroit paradisiaque, nous retrouverons seul à réfléchir David Servan Schroeder sur comment sauver des vies. Il est parti tout le mois de juillet aux États-Unis. Enfin, il s'en est mordu les doigts, tu vois, de ne pas être là. There's so much to do, you know, and I'm just one person. And I have cancer cells, you know, and I, and I know how important it is to my sanity and my health, and uh, as well as the health of my family, that we stay connected. Uh, it's not so reasonable for me to be on the road as much as I am. We have shown you what you can do to help you strengthen your body's defenses against cancer. But cancer is not only about broccoli and jogging. For a lot of people who've been diagnosed with cancer, there's a major question that arises, which is, did I bring this on to myself? Did I do something somehow that helped this disease creep into my life? Most oncologists derive the belief that stress is not related to whether we develop cancer or not. I actually have a slightly different tack on that question. Stressors make us feel discouraged, make us feel helpless, powerless. That impairs the ability of our natural defenses from fighting back cancer. Stress is a part of all of our lives. We accept it. But how we deal with it, if we deal with it at all, affects everything and can have a profound effect on our ability to fight cancer. Unlike diet, exercise, or toxins, you can't see it. Stress is by far the most intangible pillar of the anti-cancer method. But we are only now beginning to fully grasp the consequences. Stress can push your body to a breaking point, silently, without you even aware that it's happening. Stress is very useful. If you run, over, run away from a rhinoceros which is chasing you, you may have maximum stress is good. But if you spend your life thinking that the rhinoceros is chasing you, then you are in trouble. It's going to eat your neurons, it's going to eat your immune system. It's bad for everything. Before it was thought the brain can't change anymore. Nothing could be more wrong than that. And as has been shown that until we die, you know, we are 80 years old, you're still making plenty of neurons, new neurons. You're making new connections. We know that chronic stress can ha have an impact on so many other diseases. To me, the better question is, why would cancer be an exception? Now we're learning that stress hormones that are released can directly promote cancer growth and spread. In an acute stress setting, fight or flight hormones will spike up and then they will pretty quickly resolve. In a chronic stress setting, we tend to see elevations of these pathways that stay activated. So that would again create a, an environment that would promote tumor growth. All of the data that we have would tend to suggest that there is indeed a, not just a mind to body connection, but there perhaps is a mind to cancer connection as well. One of the mystery of our times is how much we underestimate the potential for change. If it turns out, as also the studies show that, that people who have tried know, that 20 minutes a day, say, of mindfulness or loving kindness meditation will change the quality of the 23 hours and 40 minutes left, including your sleep. That seems pretty good investment. Every major faith tradition 
will tell you that the body and the spirit are one and that you must care for both at the same time. You know, I, I'm not a believer in one way. Uh, one way, there are many ways, um, but there are no ways that work without connecting to the spiritual dimensions of life. Now, those are not the words you normally hear in the doctor's office. David is a true systems thinker, and this is what this disease requires. And it's not just exercise. It's not just nutrition. It's not just chemicals. It's not just well-being and emotional well-being. It's, it's all of those. And, and like a classic system, if you take one piece out, it's probably not going to work. I saw David's first symptoms just before his last trip to the U.S. It was clear he was not doing well, even though we did not know what it was about. But it was clear that it required investigation, possibly even urgent investigation. So coming back and yeah, applause, we are acknowledging the whole crowd. Hey, okay, and go. Go ahead. Welcome back to anti-cancer. And this lacks sickness. Shit, I can't say this. You can. Rehearsal, no problem. <laughs> we told him, do you really have to go? Can't you cancel? All right, let's say we're done. And uh... His response was, this is what I'm here for. Um, if you could give us a little bit more energy, do you think? <laughs> I'm so tired. We added the last slide. We just added the last slide called uh, Finding that. Meaning. Finding Meaning is the last slide on stage. We'll stop. You know, we're going to do anything you need to get you through this if there's anything you need. So don't, you know, don't. What is it in human beings that helps us keep our healthy sense of ourselves, helps us keep a sense of meaning in our life in the face of stressors if you had to guess and think about that you know the, the number one thing that human beings need is actually connectedness connection with other human beings many cancer patients live with a sense of powerlessness and hopelessness but i've been hanging on to this idea that until the very end it remains always in our power to save our lives and bring it to a meaningful conclusion. Thank you very much. I'll always wonder if David knew that the taping in Detroit was his last stand. That we were living in the moment when the doctor would become the patient once again. I 
that's the nature of a man. The nature of a man is to really take it to the edge. Voilà, la rechute, on était tous à la table. On avait demandé à ses frères de nous rejoindre. Euh, je pleurais comme une fontaine. Enfin, lui, pas du tout. Il était stoïque et disait « J'ai fait ce que je devais faire. » Il a commencé de grandes choses qu'il n'a pas terminées. David devoted his life to revealing the hope and the power that we all have in the fight against cancer. And I'm grateful to him for passing the torch to so many. Even the medical establishment is poised for change. I believe this is a true game changer. We've been able to date to raise six million dollars to fund this landmark study, which really fulfills David's vision and the people who make decisions about where healthcare dollars actually get spent will realize that lifestyle change needs to be part of the standard of care in our nation and across the world. Thankfully, the world is picking up where David left off, and change is happening. The pharmacy chain, CVS, it will no longer sell cigarettes and tobacco products in some way is changing its bread recipe, removing a chemical also used to make yoga mats. McDonald's pointed out the FDA considers it safe. Imagine a world where 70% of cancer deaths never occur. Listen up, soda fans. Bill de Blasio will take up Michael Bloomberg's fight to ban big gulp sugary drinks in New York City. Kraft macaroni and cheese won't contain artificial preservatives or the dyes that currently make it orange. In that world, the disease that haunts us... Ah, what's the worst that could happen? ...doesn't look so scary. I'm a tumor, I'm a tumor. And fighting it is a lot easier than we ever thought possible. This is about being, not doing. Congressman Tim Ryan talking about mindfulness. And so you're in a room full of people here, so it's got to be, like, really weird. <laughs> Some public schools in his home state of Ohio have started meditation classes. Human nature is not only predictable, but changeable. We now have the right tools to change our lives and increase our chance to live a life free of disease. This health and wellness trend is not a fad. It's here to stay. You know, I just can't stand the kale bragging. I just had some kale. <laughs> no one asked you. By arming ourselves with simple truths and knowing the obstacles for what and who they are, they lose their power over us, and we can take back our own lives. You as a parent should be able to walk into a grocery store, pick an item off the shelf, and tell whether it's good for your family. I will never go back. Never. Because sooner or later, and more sooner than you think, it's going to catch up with you. Come on, people. It's time to stop being afraid of cancer. It's time for cancer to be afraid of us. Time moves on, people heal, kids grow up, and the C word becomes not about disease or dying, but about living. And not in fear, not in the past, but in the here and now.